Movie Talk for Movie Fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today is John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie-related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California, and we are so glad you decided to make us part of your day. Also, we are your host of Jedi Council, Christian Harloff. What's going on, guys? Happy to be back on Schmodown Team Day. Ah. Also here is Mark Ellis. Is it Schmodown? Te it's Schmodown Team Day, ladies and gentlemen. New shirt. <laughs> also, also here because it is Schmodown Team Day is Mark Riley. Yes. Hey, happy to be here. Ooh, Team Wolves of Steel taking on heroes. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Oh, it's yeah. going to be a great match. And uh, listen, for some of you guys who follow me on social media, I mentioned a little bit earlier today that we have a big announcement that we're making today. Uh, it's something we have been uh, talking about and working about as uh, you know as, as the months have been rolling on. And to make that announcement, it's, it's not going to be me. We have a special guest here to make that announcement. What? Oh, oh. who's <laughs> here? I'm the, it's Where's true. Riley? I am Mr. Mark Riley. The secret That's a great impression of Jeremy. In, we've never been sitting in the same room together. I've been here this entire time. <laughs> I've fooled you all. But we do have a big announcement today, don't we? Yes, a, we do. It's an announcement that goes back a couple years. Um, this, <laughs> let's tell a story, John. Everyone <laughs> nestle down. The story goes, a couple years ago, John Campion and I met at Comic-Con, and much to the surprise of a lot of people, we didn't hate each other. In fact, <laughs> we actually talked about wanting to work together, as you've seen in the past week and a half uh, here. And I loved visiting. And I always said one thing, there is no fucking way I'm ever moving to this place ever in my life. And then we started talking more and more. Well, and more. Yeah. And now, here, I'm going to tweet something. Just uh -oh. because. Oh, so yeah, it's live. You can go. This is at, actually live tweeting. Yeah, yeah. At Jeremy Johns, you can you can you can <laughs> this see. This has it. never it's been nice attempted plot. before no. in the show. <laughs> it's a live, yeah, yeah. It's a live <laughs> tweet happening right here. Here we go. All right, tweeted you a picture. You guys kind of get the you get the gist of it. And as of now, logistics aside, I am joining Collider Movie Talk. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks. I've never gotten a round of applause like that in my entire life. <laughs> I am again joining. Um, all right, uh, but a lot of stuff, a lot, I'm surprised at how much goes into stuff like this. I'm a dude from a small town in Washington, man. This business aspect, that ain't me. There's a lot that goes into it. So getting my stuff down here, it's, uh, it's coming on the horizon very soon. Hopefully, but uh, yeah, it's a it's a pretty big move, a pretty big change. Don't worry, my YouTube channel is still there. Boba Fett's playing with the team. Boba Fett's also solo. It's all good, <laughs> but it's a lot of fun coming. You know, I, and you know, this, this past what was two Comic Cons ago that we yeah. sat down and really started talking that we wanted to work together, and then yeah. it was this past Comic Con when uh, we started getting the picture that I was going to be coming back to movie talks so and right. we started talking and it's like maybe this is the opportunity maybe this is the time and now for months ever since you know Dennis Zen uh, and myself and, and Christian and Mark and Mark uh, we all I, I didn't name you twice there's another Mark um, you know <laughs> like uh, Dennis and I especially we, we put our heads together and Christian talking about you know there's an opportunity here for for us to do something pretty cool we just think the way that Jeremy operates I mean look I've said this for a long time as as a single film reviewer on YouTube I just think he's the best single film reviewer on YouTube uh, out there I've been a big fan of his for a long Aww. time despite his jump cut edit style uh, which, all you guys, <laughs> which is how we first met each other yeah, online absolutely. It was, great. was that that was that whole thing, and you know we we just we've been talking and you know a lot of office a lot of nights in and afternoons in Dennis's office with with me and Christian and Dennis like talking over how can we make this work how will this fit and all that kind of stuff and Jeremy talking to us he came out and and tried it a, a couple month and a half ago maybe yeah, he came yeah. out yeah yeah just then like came out again this past week and. Uh, and we're just really excited. Now, we're still working out details, and there's a lot of logistics to work out right. uh, for you getting down here. So this is going to start in the near future. We don't have a definitive start date yet. Still some, like I said, details to work out. There's a few things that aren't in stone yet, but you know, we felt really confident uh, that we can tell you guys that Jeremy's going to be part of Collider Video, and we're so excited. Thank you. And it, it is a, it's a big thing for all of us because, like I said, this was a... Uh, I, I, it was your confidence in me, John. It was the, <laughs> the point where John was like, one day I'm going to ask you, what will it take? And I was like, <laughs> I right. remember that. <laughs> Holy crap. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, really excited. And, and it's been nothing but fun thus far. And I'm hoping the fun lasts literally until we're all uh, old folk. 
Yeah, well, I mean, look, it, it, this makes sense. Also, Mark and I have been working with Jeremy now for like six years. Years. Yeah, it's been six over half years. a decade. Six yeah. years. We've known Jeremy for a very long time. And I think one of the most important thing, and this is something that John had said to me when I started on this crew, is that the main thing about this crew is the vibe and like to everyone yeah. not only can you talk about movies and it's a matter of how do you fit here how do you like it's just everyone being able to just have a good time and we all do that i mean when it, i promise you once the camera's off we're laughing we're talking movies right yeah. afterwards and jeremy is the perfect fit there so it makes a lot of sense welcome to the team brother thanks man and yeah that's a big important thing for me it's like i have built not having a job it's a <laughs> hobby and so when it never feels like work here and that's a, it's a big thing for me. It's important. Mr. Campia, uh, Jeremy and I were thinking, like, if we took our beds and made them into bunk beds here, <laughs> yeah. we'd have so much more room for activities. <laughs> so much room for activities. <laughs> I'm so excited that Jeremy's here, and he's not going to be sleeping on my red couch, which yeah. R.I.P. red couch, but... Yeah, you got to I mean, move up at some point. You, you got to move to that race car bed, man. <laughs> one day, at one point in your life. But you know what's funny? It's like Dennis and I, ever since going all the way back to the AMC days, Dennis and I always had like one real big rule about bringing any new team member on. Do they have talent? Yes. Can they carry themselves on camera? All that kind of stuff, yes. But really, as Christian was alluding to, one of the things Dennis and I always thought was really important was... Do they fit with the team? Do we all get along? Can we all go to these screenings together and go to lunch together and hang out? Do we legitimately enjoy each other's company? And it's been great having Jeremy around for a few weeks. And uh, we just think he's a great fit for us. And we're really glad you're here. I, uh, I bring the unprofessionalism everywhere I go. <laughs> 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 all right. Well, with all that stuff out of the way, let's get into some movie news. Ashley, what do we got? Yesterday, Ben Affleck confirmed the title for his standalone Batman would be called simply The Batman. Now at a recent press event for Affleck, next movie, The Accountant, Collider's own Steve Weintraub asked what it was about Deathstroke that made him the right villain for the movie. He's a great villain because I just had an instinctive feeling that he would match up with him well. You know, I'm a big admirer of that character as well, especially in the New 52, the way that they did Deathstroke, and I thought that it could work. John, what do you think about Ben Affleck's reasons behind choosing Deathstroke for The Batman? I love them. Like we've we've talked on the show before how much we like the idea that Deathstroke's going to be the villain in the movie. We all liked it and we've given our reasons for it. But I love Ben Affleck's rationale here because he wasn't just thinking, who's a popular villain? Let's put them in. He was thinking, who matches up with Batman. You know, he's he was a lot like uh, Silva in the UFC, the matchmaker Silva in the yeah. UFC. You know, he doesn't just say, who's a, two big stars in the heavyweight division? Just put them together. No. He looks at them and he thinks, what would make the best match? Matchups make great fights. And I think that's the approach Ben Affleck took here. He thought, who would be a guy that would not only be a great on screen villainous presence in the movie, but who will bring the best out of Batman in the type of movie I want to make and who will Batman bring the best out of in this type of movie? And I love the way that he's thinking that way. You don't make characters in a movie to fit the actors you're bringing in. You bring in actors to fill out the roles you have because you have a vision for the movie. I love these comments and I have so much excitement for this movie as a result. Anyway, Mark, you heard about this. What do you think about his comments? They're focusing on story, which is great because Batman movies in the past, in the 90s particularly, have sometimes done stunt casting or wanted to have villains with everybody's heard of. Not everybody's heard of Deathstroke. My mom has no idea what Deathstroke is other than something I maybe attempted in 1996. So now <laughs> Now, if they're not doing the Joker, they're not doing the Riddler, they're not doing somebody that's more famous, it means they're focusing on a good story to tell. That's the most exciting aspect of this to me. Christian? I like it because it's fresh. Because this, this character has never been seen on the big screen before. We've seen him, obviously, in Arrow and then in the video games, but never on the big screen and this is the way to do it and I, and I like like you guys are saying it's it's someone that's going to be a formidable opponent to yeah. Batman the Batman and <laughs> but to be able to see this brand new character and the fact that Joe Manganiello is going to be doing it, it, it this is going to be a battle to watch the beefed up Ben Affleck fight Manganiello just in general it's going to be something really fun I think it's a perfect choice so I'm on, I'm on board Jeremy oh yeah even from the simple premise that we've never seen him on screen like you were saying a, he's a new live action on screen villain for a Batman movie uh, but yeah 
yeah, this is going to be a physical and mental match for uh, Batman yeah. because this dude is not only, I mean, physically he can fight, but he's also a master tactician. This guy is going to bring it against Batman. And as long as they don't Arkham Knight us and have you fight him in a tank at the end, I think it's going to be a really fulfilling <laughs> movie. People did not like that. No, that was not the smartest thing to do in that game. And you know, it's great because a good friend of ours, Manu Bennett, who played Deathstroke on the Arrow show, mm -hmm. he introduced Deathstroke to a lot of people who probably never heard of him. He did a great job of it, but I think Joe Manganiello is going to do a fantastic yeah. job of this, so this is just good news all the way around. All right, what's next? According to Variety, Chloe Moretz is set to star opposite Dakota Johnson, Tilda Swinton, and Mia Goth in the new retelling of the classic horror movie Suspiria, directed by a bigger splash helmer, Luca Guadagnino. Based on the 1977 film from Italian horror master Dario Argento, the movie follows a young ballet dancer who travels to a prestigious dance academy in Europe, only to discover it is a front for something far more sinister and supernatural amidst a series of increasingly grisly murders. A release date has not been set. Christian, thoughts on a Suspiria remake with Chloe Moretz and Tilda Swinton? Um, I like the talent behind it. I think that I don't know yet until I see a trailer for this movie because does it sound like an interesting cast with an interesting premise off a movie that was uh, like by horror fans? Sure, but I, and I'm also... To no, no one's going to try to pretend that I'm the biggest horror fan. If, but if I see a trailer that kind of pops with a talent like this, I can be on board. I'm just not overly excited for it, but I'm not saying, oh, this sounds like something I never want to see. It just all depends on how it kind of formulates into this uh, package. I, it's it's difficult for me to get around the the elephant in the room here. I, I mean, this, the movie sounds great. I'm I'm excited to see what they're going to try to do with it. But she just announced she's getting away. She's dropping all movies. Right. It's like this girl I'm dating and she's hot and I think she's wonderful. And then she says to me, John, I can't date anybody right now. I got, I need time to find myself. I need to go on a long spiritual journey. Find myself. I can't be in a relationship. And I say okay. And three weeks later, John's is going out with her. <laughs> like that, that's what this is. Like she just told wow. like the little mermaid made people no like you know what i need to step back from acting everybody i need to step back and then three weeks later they read the, the open up variety and there she she signed up for the next movie he's like what this is not the first time campy has compared himself to the little mermaid just so everybody knows <laughs> mark what do you think about this i i was shocked too because it was like she didn't announce her retirement or anything but she didn't want to step back and analyze some stuff now having said all that that's fine. Suspiria is a really cool story. Yeah. So the fact that this is getting made in general gets me excited. I like when talent is involved. Reading this story, I was much more jacked to see Tilda Swinton in it than it was Chloe Moretz. Mm -hmm. But if she wants to be a part of the movie, I think it's going to be a credit to it. Jeremy. Well, as a man who just announced he's coming down to Los Angeles after he said he would never move back, <laughs> I kind of see where she's coming from, I guess. Obviously, they made it worth her while. Uh, but, uh, I mean, it's, it's a horror movie. You know, I mean, until I'm with Christian, until I see a trailer, I'm flipping a coin as to whether or not I'm looking forward to this thing. It's all about the trailer and time. Yeah. All right, guys, it is Tuesday, which means it's time for us to talk about what is opening this week, being brought to you by our good friends at AMC Theaters. we got a number of films opening, but we're going to focus in on one in particular today. Ashley, which one is that? The Girl on the Train. Woo. Commuter Rachel Watson, Emily Blunt, catches daily glimpses of a seemingly perfect couple, Scott and Megan, from the window of her train. One day, Watson witnesses something shocking unfold in the backyard of the stranger's home. Rachel tells the, uh, the authorities what she thinks she saw after learning that Megan is now missing and feared dead. Unable to trust her own memory, the troubled woman begins her own investigation while police suspect that Rachel may have crossed a dangerous line. You know, I... I have been psychotically excited about this movie. It's just, first of all, you have Tate Taylor directing it. I believe it was Tate Taylor who directed mm -hmm. it. And I am a big fan of Tate Taylor. I think his last number of films, I think have just crushed him. I've been really impressed with how he handles characters in his films. And this looks like a character kind of driven movie. And I'm not going to go into a full review on the movie at all. I, I'm just going to say I myself was kind of disappointed. Uh, I, I did not get into the film. I found that by the time the film was doing things that was getting me kind of drawn in, we were already getting into the third act. And by that point, you're already kind of mentally checked out. So, I mean, I did not hate the movie at all. But it's just for me, with the expectation levels I had going in, especially considering the talent in this movie. I love Luke Evans. And I love Emily Blunt. And I love the director but it just didn't work for me personally. So anyway, that's my Jeremy, you saw it last night. What did you think? I did, and keep, I'm like you, keeping it tight-lipped for the sake of saving it for my own review. Um, I didn't hate the movie. Uh, it's definitely a long haul of a movie, but I, I agree, the movie does have problems. Emily Blunt is good in the movie, for sure. Actually, she really is. Yeah, yeah, yeah I mean, she does bring it. You can tell you're like, oh, this is like one of those going for the Oscar kind of moments. 
but um, I'm looking forward to Christian's review because I feel like <laughs> that's going to be more entertaining. Well, speaking of Christian, <laughs> we went with our buddy Mark last night, not this guy, uh, and he and I and he, I'm sitting next to him, and I said to him. Uh, he's like, I wasn't sure he wanted to be there. I was like, no, this is going to be really good. I'm telling you, it's, 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 this is going to be a very good movie. And he left about 15 minutes in because he had plans. And about 25 minutes, I was jealous of him. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, is a, it is way too long. It is a movie to me that is trying so hard to be Gone Girl. Um, and it just, it's dopey. It's a dopey movie. Wow. That's all I got. Mark. You know, John, <laughs> as novel adaptations go, sometimes you get Jaws and sometimes you get Fifty Shades of Grey. As Emily Blunt movies go, sometimes you get Edge of Tomorrow and sometimes you get Huntsman Winter's War. This movie's in between those two films. That's a, good, that's a very nice way to put it. That's all I'm going to say. No. Yeah, I, I mean, look, it's, it's a film. This is one of those movies that I was watching because I've never read the book. But I remember watching the movie thinking, I bet this plays really well as a novel. Right. Like I just could, I, I, I just sitting there thinking this the story the way it's laid out in novel form this probably really works just didn't quite click with me. See, and, I remember uh, watching it last night and being like, I can't imagine the novel is this bad. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, like, well, like Wendy, who would keep reading it? Wendy saw, uh, read the book and saw it and said that it was. It, it didn't hold up to the book at all. Right. Which is normally the case, but it really didn't hold up. But I believe Wendy said she actually kind of enjoyed it. I think she said, yeah. you did say it kind of worked for you, right, Wendy? Kind of, but I'm disappointed. Okay. Yes, well, well, yeah. actually, that seems to be the feeling around the table. All right, folks, yeah. we've reached that part of the show now for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her, Ashley's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. And those at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or assault. So Ashley, what do we got? It's a wrap on Spider-Man Homecoming. Principal photography on the brand new Spidey adventure came to an end after filming began back in June. Some John Hughes-esque footage was also teased at San Diego Comic-Con back in July. A ton of leaked set photos have been shared. However, we still have yet to see any sign of Michael Keaton, nor do we have confirmation of this of his part, though he's rumored to play the villain Vulture. Spider-Man Homecoming also stars Marissa Tomei as Aunt May and Robert Downey Jr. Jr. is Tony Stark slash Iron Man. The film hits theaters on July 7, 2017. Jeremy, after all the leaked set photos and all the rumors, and now that the production has wrapped, do you buy or sell Spider-Man Homecoming the movie? Uh, after I hear Spider-Man Homecoming, I am on the buy until <laughs> you tell me something that's completely awful, and it has to be pretty bad for me to sell. So I'm going to say buy. I mean, every day that there's news about Spider-Man Homecoming is one day closer we get to Spider-Man Homecoming <laughs> coming home. So I am <laughs> really pumped about this um bring on i mean i've i've been more excited for spider-man homecoming than any any superhero movie in a very long time wow. because i mean i was a big spider-man was my guy everyone was like yo batman batman's cool and dark but spider-man was like me in high school he let everyone know that it was okay to be a nerd and you didn't have to eat your green vegetables and be superman to be a superhero you can embrace your nerdiness and be a superhero so i really connected with spider-man at a young age and Spider-Man Homecoming is doing Spider-Man the way I remember Spider-Man. Mark Ellis. Uh, you don't need to eat your green vegetables here at Collider, but carrots really help everything. Thank you, carrots, baby. Uh, I'm excited about this, but anytime I hear that something rat production that they're done shooting, it means that we can get excited about the film for three months until they have reshoots, and then we all get nervous about it again. So, like, it's cool that we're that step closer, and we're not going to see any more leaked set photos because I was getting a little tired of seeing, oh, look at this leaked photo, look at this leaked photo. There's a lot of stuff coming out of the Spider Man Homecoming set. So, the fact that they're rat means we're not going to get any more teases that we don't want. We can just wait for that first trailer. This is a huge buy for me. Look, I don't know that you could have introduced this new Spider-Man into this new universe any better than they did in Civil War. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, mm -hmm. and he's in two scenes. He's in, if you, well, if you count the post credit scene, he's in three, but let's, <laughs> he's in two scenes. And you could just tell they nailed the essence of the character right off the bat, and I was excited about it. Here's something that is really fascinating to me, though. Ashley was mentioning that we still don't know what Michael Keaton is doing in this movie. There were no mm -hmm. pictures of Michael Keaton. We live in a day and age now where everybody carries a global communication and multimedia device in their pocket. <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of people working on these sets and they've got their security so tight, not one blurry from 500 yards away picture of Michael Keaton at all. 
color me impressed. I think that's pretty cool that they've done that. And you're right, inevitably, we're gonna hear about reshoots soon, and then inevitably, a bunch of people who still don't understand how these movies work are gonna panic and say something's terribly wrong, and then inevitably, we're gonna try to calm everybody down. But no, for me, everything I've seen and heard coming out of this project, huge aces for me, it's a buy. It's a huge buy for me also, and the fact, you know, Ellis and I were able to see the little teaser that they put together at Comic-Con for Hall H, and it was very similar to me the first time I felt when two weeks into filming of Guardians of the Galaxy, they had that little teaser at Comic-Con like three years ago, whatever it yeah. was. That's the kind of feel I had, that they're so confident things are going so well that the tone that they pitched the movie was going to be showed up on that screen when they showed just that little teaser so i can guarantee that the buzz is going to be crazy once they put together a version of that because similar to that guardians the thing that we saw at comic-con when they released that months later was pretty much the same exact yeah thing. it was so i think we're going to get a lot of the same thing that we saw at hall h and people will lose their minds on that and i think that hearing all these things and hearing the we, we heard a little there's a kind of a rumor going around about the potential three villains in spider-man right now we'll see if that's the case in some of the trailers also so a lot of cool stuff coming out of this movie and I, this is to me the first Spider-Man the Sam Raimi one I was very excited about because there was always rumors that we were getting a James Cameron Spider-Man back in like 95 <laughs> never happened then we finally got Raimi's Spider-Man and I was so excited to see it I haven't been that excited for Spider-Man since then and now I am. And think about this too, is that when the name Spider-Man Homecoming was introduced, it, it didn't get an overwhelmingly positive response. We're like, Spider-Man Homecoming, that's the name of your big Spider-Man comeback pitch? Seems like everybody's on board now because we know a little bit more about what the tone of the film is. I had never had a problem with the title, but you know what, there's the one thing coming out of the Spider-Man production that made me take a little bit of a pause. And actually, correct me if I'm wrong, Zend Zendaya? Zendaya. Zendaya, yeah. sorry. So, so Zendaya. <laughs> Zendaya, Zendaya. Um, Zendaya being in there, because we still don't officially know if she's Mary Jane, right. but the first report out was she was going to be Mary Jane. We don't know if that's true. And my one hesitation at the time was, man, it's, it doesn't really matter all that much, but I really want my Mary Jane to be a redhead, right? And then Robert Meyer Burnett, I think, was on the show with me that day, and he sent me a picture of Zendaya as a redhead. I guess she did herself up in red hair at some point, took a picture, I'm like, Forget it, forget my objects, <laughs> I'm completely on board. I think she could crush it as Mary Jane if that is the character who she's going to be, which we still don't know. All right, what's next? A new TV spot has been released for Marvel's newest leading man, Doctor Strange. The short look this time focuses on Strange's mystical artifact known as the Cloak of Levitation, and as evidenced by the funny TV spot, has a mind of its own. The movie is directed by sinister Helmer Scott Derrickson and stars Benedict Cumberbatch, Chiwetel Ejiofor, Rachel McAdams, Benedict Wong, Mads Mikkelsen, and Tilda Swinton. It hits theaters on November 4th. Mark Byersell, the new Doctor Strange TV spot. There's such a positive vibe here in the room with Jeremy's announcement and everybody's buying everything. We're excited about Spider-Man and all these movies and I'm going to sell this TV spot. I did not like this TV spot for what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to introduce new people. There's a movie called Doctor Strange coming out. And while it does that, I didn't like the tone of this, albeit 15 seconds. It seemed like they were trying to hit it way too hard with the comedy and that's not the vibe that I think you go with with Doctor Strange. You can have jokes in there and that's fine. And from the footage we've seen, we know that Doctor Strange is going to have more humor than a lot of people suspect but I didn't think it was the right angle to take on this TV spot. They're focusing on the cloak, which is great, but if you're a hardcore fan and you know what that cloak means, you've already seen Doctor Strange footage, so this is not an announcement to you. It's an announcement to the rest of the world, and I didn't think they pulled it off as well as they could have. I completely agree. I sell this spot completely, because you know what? You know why the humor works in all the other stuff we've seen mm -hmm. from Doctor Strange? It's because it's not set up as a humor piece. You know, we see these other spots for Doctor Strange. We see worlds colliding into each other, they're trying to save reality, a doctor losing his hands, all this stuff, and then that's the Wi-Fi password. And you, when mm -hmm. it peppers in there, it has impact, it has bang, it has effectiveness. When they don't do that and they just set up a comedy bit, da, 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 like, and that's what this comedy- this, You may as well have Porky Pig at the end of this yeah. thing. No, you know? really, I mean, no, it just did not work for me. And I understand they're trying to say, hey, let's make sure some people understand because Doctor Strange is more mystic, it might look a little weird to some people. Let's remind him it's gonna be funny. You know, you did that with the last trailer, you did it more effectively. This did not work for me. And I'm sure in context, in the movie, sure. those bits are gonna work, but just as a trailer, as a TV spot, it didn't. So for me, it's a big sell. 
Third cell. Uh, it, yeah, it's just, it's false advertising in a way, also because it's selling mm -hmm. this movie, and I'm glad it is selling it as this silly comedy, which it isn't. It's something complete. I didn't like the way that the humor hit either, and it's too short. Like you you said, the stuff that we saw when the humor was in there, peppered in, it absolutely worked. But this is it. It doesn't mean I'm super excited for this film, but the 15 seconds I don't think does it justice, especially when you're trying to bring in new fans. They're probably like, what the hell is this? So I'm going to sell it. Yeah, um, emulating all the cells. Uh, it, it, it's a fine line to promote the movie and then show you way too much. I mean, 15 seconds to show you what? I mean, a little bit about the cape, a little bit of humor, right. a lot of bit of humor. It's it, it's to the point where if you know Doctor Strange, like you said, Mark, you know every, you know what you need to know about Doctor Strange. Who are you selling this to? You know, who are you pitching this to? Um, at a point, I don't need a roadmap to all things strange. I want to go in there and be a little surprised. I don't need 15 second spots every week for Doctor Strange. So, no. It's almost like, you remember when they had that tag at the Ant Man trailer and it was like, can we change the name? And, and, it, and it's like, oh, they seem a little nervous about just marketing it as Ant Man as yeah. a serious movie because maybe the audience won't buy a movie called Ant Man <laughs> unless we give a little like, wink and nod joke to it. I don't think you need to take that same approach yeah. with Doctor Strange. I think we're either going to see it or we're not. And if you put more humor to make it look like a flat out comedy, I don't think that helps the movie. Yeah. It, I mean, it's a Marvel movie. Have you seen the grosses of these things? Whether they're nervous, people aren't going to see it. It's just, right. I mean, if this was coming out <laughs> post Incredible Hulk, maybe. But like this is, I mean, we're 2016 now, so I just don't get what they're thinking. All right. What's next? According to THR, Mahershala Ali, who plays the villain known as Cottonmouth on Marvel's Netflix series Luke Cage, is in negotiations to join the James Cameron-produced Alita Battle Angel. Set in the 26th century, Alita tells of a female cyborg that is discovered in a scrapyard by a scientist. With no memory of her previous life except her deadly martial arts training, the woman becomes a bounty hunter tracking down criminals. The movie will be directed by Robert Rodriguez, but no release date has been set. John Byers sell Ali and Alita Battle Angel. Would have been tough to answer this question just a week ago, but after watching Luke Cage and seeing his, like a lot of people think Cottonmouth might have been like one of the shining, maybe the shining point of that entire series and see the type of performance and the presence that he brings to the screen. I like it a lot. For me, it's a buy. Jeremy. Yeah, I uh, I tried my best to stay out of Luke Cage as I'm here because you guys are watching it and I'm going, and I'm just like leaving the room. But I saw a couple scenes, both of which were with him. Yeah. And both of of which were pretty menacing. So, I mean, the premise sounds great. It just sounds interesting to me. It's like a real steal with angels or something. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, and with him on it, also, I agree with you. A week ago, I'd have been like, I have zero idea. But from what I saw, I'm liking it. Christian? I'm buying it, but I'm buying it because of things that I'm hearing. I've seen him in other things before also. But, I, right. as, but, but from what I'm hearing at Luke Cage, I haven't seen it yet. Looking forward to seeing it and binging it. But from hearing from you and from other people that it's exciting and, and the fact that he's standing out like this and he's being recognized I'm, I'm buying it. It's also really interesting it's going to be kind of cool to see what kind of sensibilities Robert Rodriguez brings to yeah. it as well. Anyway Mark you heard about this what do you think? Uh, Jeremy and Christian have not done a good enough job of conveying to you guys how hard it has been to be in the office the last couple of weeks <laughs> because we have like one huge common room where the big TV is and that's where everybody's watching Luke Cage to do the reviews and then we're trying to get work done but it's turned up so loud that you can't help but hear a lot of things going on and and if I try to get John's attention or Riley's attention or anybody else watching Luke Cage, it's like I'm talking it's to like, a okay, wall. Later, There's later, come nothing. back later. So just based on how engaged you guys have been in Luke Cage so far, I'm going to have to give this a buy. Plus, I love the premise. All right, what's next? To prepare fans for the Harry Potter spin-off Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, Warner Brothers and IMAX have announced that all eight Harry Potter films are being re-released in IMAX for a one-week exclusive engagement. Additionally, the first two Potter films, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone and Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, have been digitally remastered for their IMAX debut. Jeremy, buy or sell a one-week IMAX re-release of the Harry Potter franchise. Um, I'm a big Harry Potter fan, but for me, IMAX, I like seeing IMAX movies movies in IMAX when they were filmed in IMAX. I don't know mm. what the digital re-release is, but you, the resolution in an IMAX screen pops when it was filmed with IMAX cameras. I don't know how this is going to play out. At this point, they know they can re-release Harry Potter in any amount of theaters, and it's going to crush and make money. And I'm a sucker for it, so I'll probably end up buying it. Is this back to back? Are they doing it back to back to back? Like I, I thought like the Avengers, a, like they do. Yeah, yeah. Right. It's like a whole. If it's a marathon, I'll go see it. If it's just a couple, no. 
Mark. <laughs> Wait, so if it's just four hours out of your yeah, life, yeah, you're saying no. Yeah. If it's three days out of your life, you're done, going. Done today. I mean, look, I like money, so go ahead and make it. That's why you do this thing. It's going to make money, and it's a smart marketing play because it gets people talking about Harry Potter again, and then you want to go see Fantastic Beasts, which right. is the movie I'm really looking forward to. That's the only one I'm going to see in theaters this fall, but I'm really excited about it. Christian. Oh, it's a big buy. I mean, it's it's smart and it gets it gets excitement going. They do this like we're talking about with the Avengers or with Star Wars. They, they show you the movies that it might not lock in completely to the new movie that we're going to see. It's like 70 years beforehand, but it's the world and you're going to it's going to get you excited once again to see it. Plus, it's an IMAX. Yeah. Um, and speaking of uh, Harry Potter, a big Harry Potter fan is the Olympic gold medalist Cody Miller. Yes, um, yes, he who is. I'm sure is very excited about this, and he will also be on Movie Talk this Woo. Thursday. Yeah, Olympic yeah. gold medalist. Going to look forward to having him there. Look, I buy the concept of re-releasing these films. Now, some people online are like questioning: Is this just a money grab by the studios? But like, you take somebody like my wife, who is a massive fan of Harry Potter massive fan of Harry Potter. She wants this, especially with Fantastic Beasts coming. She would love to get back into the theater and watch Harry Potter on the big screen again. Now, the whole IMAX angle to this, honestly, I think it's just an excuse to charge a higher premium on the, on the ticket price to get them into those theaters because they charge more for IMAX theaters. I don't think it'll be as good as something or look at, it'll look great. It will look mm -hmm. magnificent. Probably not as good as that, the Dark Knight scenes that yeah, are shot no, in okay. actual IMAX cameras. But still, this is for the fan. The fans want this. And when the fans want it, it's not just a money grab. So for me, uh, it's it's got to be an absolute big buy. All right, folks, well, we're doing this show live today. So if you're watching this show live right now, make sure you're following us on Twitter, at Collider Video, because we're going to spare a few minutes at the end of the show to take some of your live Twitter questions. You can actually start sending in those questions right now. Just tweet them to us, at Collider Video, and Wendy's going to pick some out for us to go at the end. But I want to remind you, that Movie Talk is not the only show on Collider Video today. A little bit later today, we got Collider Nightmares. is coming at 5 o'clock Pacific Standard Time. And the Team Schmodown that Mark and Christian were referencing a little bit earlier, Team Heroes. That's Robert Meyer Burnett and our very own John Schnepp taking on Team Wolves of Steel, the departed Mark Riley and, <laughs> and Clark Wolf. Yeah, where did Mark go, by the way? He's jump roping in the basement. I'm right, right here. Now. I'm yeah. telling you. And, I'm to John's <laughs> and that drops at 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Make sure you subscribe to us on YouTube at Collider Video. All right. It's time for Mailbag. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, just email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. Every day we take a couple of your questions. So Ashley, what's in the mailbag? Daz writes, hi guys, I know you don't like shot for shot remakes like Psycho. Would you be okay for the live action remake of The Lion King to be a shot by shot remake? We'd love to know your thoughts. P.S. I've been a big fan since the AMC days. You know, shot for shot, you're right, in, in general, I don't like the concept of shot for shot remakes because I want new filmmakers to put their own spin on this story. Give us the, the story of whatever the original was, but put your spin on it, put your fingerprint on it. However, there are exceptions. Like even in the terms of adapting, like say a graphic novel, I still want the filmmakers to adapt it for the film medium, put their own spin on it, give their own unique flavor to it. But then you get like the original Sin City, speaking of Robert Rodriguez, that was like a shot for shot movie adaptation of the graphic novel. And in that circumstance, it worked great. For Lion King, I'll be honest with you, I hadn't considered it, but I don't think you should because I think you can do different things with the CGI technology that they have now that maybe they couldn't do before. Maybe you want to make it a little bit differently, but I'll be honest with you, the idea doesn't turn me off. The idea does not turn me off. Christian, what do you think? If Jungle Book hadn't been made, then I think I'd be on that page. Mm. The, but the fact that I think you'd be wasting John Favreau's talents if you did a shot-by-shot -shot remake right now. I mean, it would be fun, but you'd also say, what's the point? Because like you mentioned, look what they did with Jungle Book. Look what they did with Cinderella. They added to some of the mythology that was already there beforehand, and they brought something new to it and something that enriched the, the, the yeah, overall story really well, and they can absolutely do that again because there were things I had just watched the, before I saw Jungle Book in April. I just watched the uh, the seventies one with my or the late sixties, whatever it was, with my daughter, and I had just noticed all the differences and how it just made it so much better. So I'd rather see Favreau, who's already locked into this world, put his spin on it. Give us the stuff we love. I mean, give me, give me Scar. Give me the give me that, Hakuna Matata. Yeah, give me all that stuff that I love, but but give me some new stuff also in the Favreau style. 
Christian or yes. Mark. All right, so I was thinking. <laughs> Christian, give us oh, the yeah, second yeah, part right. of your opinion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. By the way, that Wolves of Steel shirt is awesome. Yeah, this is a Wolves of Steel shirt, by the way. Uh, sorry, Heroes. I just like their logo better than yours because you don't have one yet. <laughs> I would have worn that, but I mean, neither one of those teams is Van Halen, so right. that's why you get this. And I do not want to see a shot for shot remake of The Lion King because I think it's a terrible idea. I think it's a horrifically stupid idea to have all this talent, all this ability, and just do a shot for shot remake. Plus, if the Jungle Book is any indication, they took a lot of hallmarks from the original Jungle Book, but they didn't use all the songs. Right. It's not singing, every, and there's a lot of singing and dancing going on in The Lion King. You may not necessarily want that, or may not translate well to live action animals, so I think it's a very bad idea to do. It was a good question, very bad idea to do. I will agree with you, boys. There's a lot of shots that you need to put in there. You need to put something like that in there. You know, you here's know? an example of something that really worked in the original Lion King. Uh, I just can't wait to be king. Mm -hmm, that yeah. song works great in it. I don't think it would work well in a live action feeling CGI thing. I think that's probably a song you can take out. He might say, I can't wait to be king, and then all of a sudden they're like, ah, yes. that's the, with the, from the song. <laughs> Jeremy. Yeah, I'm totally agreeing with you. you. You brought on John Favreau for a reason. Why not use him? I mean, yeah. you do a shot for shot, you can get Joe Blow, his intern, to direct the movie, and it would probably, you can emulate all the shots, and it would be accurate. I already have ideas in my head of certain scenes that you can do in live action to really draw out the drama and just make make people who are like, oh, I've seen the Mufasa death scene a hundred times. It gets me, but not like it did to where you draw it out and where right. they revert to children again in their theater seats crying. So I want to see that. You can only do that if you don't make it shot for shot. I still remember when they re-released Lion King a few years ago for, for that anniversary releasing and watching that in that scene in Mufasa. Oh, man. It's like, I, I, I'm a grown-ass man and I'm watching it and I'm like, yeah, <laughs> sure. You know, getting all kind of torn up. All right, what's next? Joshua writes, hello, Collider crew. Greetings from Australia. I'm a huge Ooh. fan and have been watching since the first John Campia's AMC days. Recently, it's not AMC. It's John Campia's AMC. <laughs> <laughs> Recently, I have noticed in our nerd news, it's been all DC since Comic-Con in July. DC hasn't allowed Marvel the chance to have the spotlight. For example, when Marvel released the Thor <laughs> Civil War special, the next day, DC responded by revealing Deathstroke, putting all the conversation on DC. Do you think this is a smart strategy by DC since they're playing catch up or do you think Marvel is holding off purposely? P.S. Do you guys believe there's a chance we could get something for Guardians of the Galaxy ahead of Doctor Strange? Thanks for taking my question and thanks for the great shows you guys do daily. Yeah, I think there's a lot of uh, game, I, but I, honestly, to this day, I believe friendly gamemanship going on between yeah. Marvel and DC. But you have to remember, like ultimately, all that matters at the end of the day is when the movies hit the theater and did the audience like it, and then they go out to it. I mean, that's the big thing. But remember, right now, we've been talking about this a little bit, about DC wanting to control and change the narrative. Because the narrative of the DC Cinematic Universe after Batman v Superman, despite the fact that myself and some other people liked Batman versus Superman, there was a lot of people out there who didn't. And we're talking about the negatives of Batman versus Superman, and that's all they talked about when you'd bring up the DC Cinematic Universe. It would be people complaining about Batman versus Superman or the things they didn't like about Suicide Squad. What became very clear at Comic-Con was DC went into change the conversation mode. And that's what they've been doing. They did something I don't remember any other studio doing. Because normally we get invited to set visits and you go to the set visit, but then you have to sit on that report until a week for a year until the week before that movie comes out in theaters. But what DC did and Warner Brothers did is something I think was very smart. Like I thought it was confusing at the time, but in hindsight it was brilliant. They invited journalists out to do a set visit. One of our own journalists from Collider went out to there. And then they said, by the way, you can go home and post your reports right now. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Because they wanted people to start talking about the future. They announced Ben Affleck becoming executive producer. They announced Jeff Johns. They taught they have their own, like the the uh, the CEO of Time Warner, I believe it was, coming out and saying, there are things we can do better. All this kind of stuff, they're trying to change the conversation. And little moves like dropping your big announcement after the other guy drops their announcement to try to take back the conversation at this stage in the game. It's really a smart move. And to be honest, I think it's working. I think a lot, you still hear a lot of people complaining about the DC Cinematic Universe yet, but you still hear more people, I believe, talking about the optimistic outlook a lot of people have about the DCU at this point because of all this new news. Anyway, I don't know, Christian, am I looking too much into this or how do you feel DC's handling this? No, I, listen, I don't care what you think about the particular movies, the quality of the films. The way that they have had brand awareness 
is is incredible. Yeah, their brand awareness is incredible. The way they've marketed absolutely works so well, because I do think that they they look at what Marvel's doing and they okay, okay drop. It. It's very political. <laughs> I mean, it's it's it is. It's it's in a way like okay, that person said that. Our story, I believe, is bigger, and I think more people will be talking about it. So let them have that. Boom! I think you're absolutely right that I think that they they hit uh, the store thing, which was funny and was great. But news about a potential, you know, the, uh, the Batman or whatever it might be, those things about story intertwined about what we're going to see next. And because we're so curious about what's happening next with Batman, give us more, give us more, give us more. It's smart. They, they have great properties. And like you said, they're working on it to change tone, to try to do new things. Right. Um, so this is also them letting us know. All, we're all aware of that. We're all aware that they're changing things now. We're all aware, like you mentioned, with the, with the set visit. There's all this awareness. Now, I think it's a very smart marketing. I think DC has been killing it in their marketing. Mark. I just feel so bad for Marvel. I mean, DC, just, <laughs> just shut them up. Stop bullying Marvel, man. They're just little guys. Come on here. It's it, Marvel, I don't think, cares as much as DC with this kind of information. I mean, sure, there's set photos from Spider-Man you'll see or, or other things about their upcoming films, but DC has to change the conversation more so than Marvel and get it on the future of their movies to get people <laughs> excited. So I don't think Marvel places a premium on that. You know, I mean, to be honest, I would rather have my movie studios focusing on making great films films than focusing on having a great social media presence. Now, I think that the DC movies coming up look awesome. I am so excited to see Wonder Woman and Justice League and the Batman, but Marvel has a more proven track record, so I don't think they're concerned about this in the slightest when the news drops. It's a smart move for DC, though, to say, oh, okay, Marvel's going to do this here. We have this card we can play. Right. We can make this announcement. So it's a smart move, don't get me wrong, and I also think to answer the other part of the question, you should go see Doctor Strange in theaters. If you don't watch trailers on YouTube because you're going to see a new Rogue One trailer and you're probably going to see something from Guardians of the Galaxy 2 as well. And it's important to keep in mind that Marvel and DC are in two different places. DC's in a place where, you know what, at Comic-Con we got to drop a Justice League trailer, we got to drop Wonder Woman. We need to show the movie-going audience we can make these movies great and we can make them what they want them to be. So we got to tell them about Ben Affleck, tell them about the Batman, tell them. Marvel's in a different place. They don't need to convince the movie-going audience right now that their movies can be fun and entertaining. The audience already finds them that way. So they have a different focus. So DC is doing something that Marvel just doesn't need to do at this point, which again, is smart on Warner Brothers part. What do you think, Jeremy? Yeah, it's like the old Sega Genesis versus Super Nintendo days, you know? I mean, it's just like, it's like Super Nintendo's Marvel, Sega Genesis is, uh, is DC. Although back then, Super Nintendo would always go second, but it did work out for them. Genesis would drop the 16-bit, then Super Nintendo did, you know? So you, it, there's something advantageous, as Pete Carroll knows, when you win the coin toss, <laughs> give the ball to the other guy first, go next, see how they do it. Um, they're doing what they need to do, and they are doing the marketing right, but it's all about the quality of the content, which uh, Marvel, as you all said, just doesn't really, they should be concerned going forward, but in terms of the expectation, they don't really have as much to worry about as DC. So DC's doing it right. We'll see if it pays you off. You just blew my mind with that Genesis Super Nintendo. You know it, man. <laughs> That's Genesis a real always, war. The one thing you can say about Genesis is they always had better sports games. Yes. And then Tecmo Super Bowl came out and was much better for uh -huh. SNES. Yeah. And that changed the game. Absolutely. All right, folks, so I said we'd save a little bit of time for your live Twitter questions at the end of the show, and we're going to do that right now. Once again, make sure you're following us on Twitter, at Collider Video, firing some questions. Wendy has picked some out, so Wendy, what do you got? This one comes from A. Clay, and he says, have you ever felt that a group of movie critics were not being totally honest towards a movie? Well, I mean, out of the, the universe of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of movie critics with tens of thousands and tens of thousands and tens of thousands of movies, Sure, I mean, yeah. the law of average says that's going to happen from time to time. For the most part, I mean, look, I can only speak from my experience. I cannot speak for everybody's experience. My own experience is the film critics I know, they have generally or always thought whether their opinion was popular or not, they've always just basically given what their opinion is. I mean, that's all you can do as a film critic and not worry about the rest of that stuff. But I'm sure it has happened. I mean, I mean, the law of average says it has to. I don't know, Christian, what's your experience been? Yeah, I, I think that it happens a lot to be honest with you but I think that more I, I would say it's a small percentage but I think that a lot of times 
it could be written, it could be video, but I think sometimes people want to get noticed, and if they haven't, and it might be hard for them whether or not they no one's, they don't have the clicks or they don't have the views, they go, well, everyone loves this movie, so I'll hate this movie right now, or vice versa, to get the hits, and it happens. You see it all the time. Now, it's not it's it's going to get comments, it's going to get you noticed, but it might not always have the effect that you want, but I've seen it happen many times in print, like, I mean, even before I got into this, and we're going to, like, Rotten Tomatoes and seeing all the percentage, and there's one guy and I'm like there's no way he's doing this every single time every time he would go against the grain to because he would be the one that would be collected get a ton of hate stuff but everyone started to know who he was Jeremy yeah I before I was on YouTube I thought that a lot like ah, oh, that person's bought off and then I started doing YouTube and then 2016 hit and I was like holy crap it sucks when people accuse you of that yeah and so <laughs> I, I mean it just does you know so I think I'm with you I'm like Generally speaking, the majority of people just give their honest opinion. I'm sure there is a small percentage of people that do that lie basically just for the sake of hits, just for the sake of views. I don't think it's a big epidemic, but it has to happen out there. Uh, sorry, I'm just depositing my recent check from Marvel. <laughs> with you guys. I think I, the ones that I really get suspicious of, the reason why I was shaking my head yes, is because a lot of times you'll see one review come out like two months before a movie's been released. And they're just raving about it, like how great it is. And sometimes it's honest, but other times I'm like, wait, wait, wait. How did you get to see this and talk about this movie so far in advance when nobody else is allowed to get their eyes on it? That's when I start to question it. But it really is a case-by-case -case basis, and I don't think it happens that much. All right, what's next? John Sava says, would you cast The Rock and, Hef and Kevin Hart as Timon and Pumbaa in the Lion King movie? <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah, okay, wait, wait a second, wait not, a second. Not... not not 15 seconds ago. Yeah. yeah. But now. But I, I don't, like, at first when she's reading it off, like, that's ridiculous. Wait a minute. Maybe? Like, Kevin Hart is Timon? I don't know that he could sing, but I, I, I don't know that he can't. I mean, it's, okay, I'll say it's not the most ridiculous idea in the world. I but love that idea. I, 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 I think it would make total sense if for no other reason, because they are two of the biggest promotional machines that exists in the galaxy right now. So you already have all of this positive press coming out of the Jungle Book and the Lion King and Favreau and it's live action. Look at how great it looks. And you have those two guys stumping for your movie because they're involved in it. it. It's a great marriage to me. I don't want the rock playing Pumbaa. Uh, I definitely. Yeah, it's hard to hear him do the, doing that voice. I don't You'd want, have to change the voice completely. I don't want him doing uh, rock doing. I think Kevin Hart could do Timon for sure, but I, I don't. I don't know. I, I kind of see it. I still would like to. to Get the get the the guys who did it the first place. They're still around. They, there's the show. My daughter watches Nathan the, Lane. My yeah. daughter watches the Lion Guard, which is like the spinoff show. And they and the voices they're there. They're they're able to do. Nathan it. Lane does that? Not uh, not Nathan Lane. Nathan okay. Lane doesn't do Pumbaa, but the uh, I think for Timon they have Tim, Timon's voice. But I, Nathan, Nathan Lane that was, is Nathan Lane. Wait, the other, vice versa. The other way the other one. But but they were doing um they were doing like the spinoff ones when it was going when Michael Eisner was in charge of everything and they were doing those direct to DVD Lion King two or three or seventy three or go to space. They had, they had, space. they had those original voices. So get them back. Yeah, four minutes ago I was pushing for Christian and Mark, but now. <laughs> yeah. oh, wait, never mind. Never mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're totally yeah. there. <laughs> We're totally there. I, I mean, it's not a horrible idea, really. Um, I mean, a lot of people have seen a lot of Kevin Hart to the point where people are now like, "Oh, well, it's not cool to like Kevin Hart anymore," you know. But that that just happens on the social uh, social media verse. But it really is. I had the same reaction as you. I was like, wait. <laughs> <laughs> why not? I can't think of a reason why not. So in that, ain't not a bad idea. Okay, what's next? All right, I'm going to attempt to say this person's Twitter name. <laughs> in Tech Hub, Sadikin says, how come there isn't any marketing for the founder, Michael Keaton's new biopic? Well, I think what you're probably looking for, first of all, they did put out at least one trailer. Two, I uh, I, and I think yeah. two, so correct me if I'm wrong, I think it was two, but I know they put out at least one. No, absolutely they put out two, yeah. that's right. Mm -hmm. uh, and it looked great, it got kind of announced where it's coming. This is an Oscar release kind of movie. And right now we still have a couple of big blockbusters coming, especially when you're looking at Doctor Strange. I have a feeling they're gonna probably wait until like that big juggernaut is is out of the way, it's got this thing done, then they'll start pushing their campaigns. And I also think they're gonna use a lot of their campaign and, and uh, advertising money 
for after the film comes out because you know they're going to be doing Oscar pushes with this movie. It just looks like that kind of a film. So I, I wouldn't read anything to that not being there yet. Jeremy, what do you think? Yeah, I just think that they don't want to show too much on the cape and the humor like Doctor Strange. They've <laughs> learned from what we have said here at this round table and now they're uh, adjusting accordingly. But I really, if, uh, it's an Oscar push movie. How many times do you see a lot of marketing for a lot of that? I mean, you're going to see it around November or December. So yeah, it, it is what it is. I think it's pretty much the norm. Yeah, I mean, just because the movie's based on McDonald's doesn't mean it has the marketing ability of McDonald's. Right. Like, they just shove it in our face constantly. Plus, this movie was originally coming out in August. Yep. And yeah. it was so it, it, it was so good and it got such positive reaction. And they really thought they had an Oscar contender on their hands. So they pushed it to December. So that's why you're not hearing as much about it, because we already would have seen it. No, it's not a big blockbuster. This is a perfect time to just kind of wait let the blockbusters have all their marketing when it's time when the Oscar awards start. It's right around the corner, creeping up in the December releases. You're going to see, I think November is when you'll get a pretty big push for this movie because they have a lot of confidence in it. Obviously, they moved it from August to December. All right, let's take two more. Okay, this one's a Jeremy question. Uh -oh. So now that you've, uh, and this is coming from just a lot of people in the chat, so I'll just figure out, just get it out there. So now that you've joined Collider, what's going to happen to your channel? Uh, that's a yeah, great, this that clear is about an that. awesome question. You are the best person <laughs> ever. I'm go Thank you, Wendy, for picking that, because that's something I just needed to address. So can I just say the tweets about this whole thing have been awesome, by the way. <laughs> I've been reading them as we've been doing this. Uh, my channel changes uh, zero. It's the same exact thing. I, do, I will do the same videos I've done for the past seven years on but actually a better schedule because I could screen the movies earlier here because Seattle no one cares about screenings in Seattle <laughs> but LA that's when you get into a screening two weeks early uh, but uh, I mean same thing uh, trailers I like I'll talk about them the same um, I would have done otherwise the movies I review I'm gonna review same as I would have done otherwise nothing on my channel changes is completely compartmentalized from this so hey if you don't want to see me on a round table you still got my channel if you like my channel want to see me talk about more things come over here and watch that uh, that's the advantageous thing about it is because I, I always thought to myself, well, I'll just stay at home because if I wanted to just talk about something, I don't need to go anywhere. I can just do it. And then after seven years, I've accepted the fact that I'm just probably not going to talk about a lot of stuff like zero of the uh, things that we've talked about here, I would have done on my channel. So it's just an opportunity for me to talk about more and for you to hear me talk about more if you want to hear me talk about more. But my channel remains untouched by this. Yeah, and it's really important for people to understand that for Jeremy, this is an in addition to move, right. not a in place of right. move. I th it was really important to us too. I know Dennis and myself and Christian and Mark, we all talked about it here that it was important to us that Jeremy maintain his presence with his channel and everything like that. So that is not going anywhere. Absolutely. I, I've been in negotiations with people before. and That's my first question. I'm like, what do you want to do with my channel? I'm telling you right now, you can't do a thing. And sometimes they, they're like, well, We'd like you to change. I'm like, bye, and I just leave. And so that's that. So, I mean, yeah, thank you for respecting that. And uh, so here we are. All right, what's next? <laughs> bye. Uh-oh, uh-oh, that was a good one. I was pulling up with the next Twitter question and a GIF of Jeremy pops up and you have your Superman, uh, your cape. My Star Wars curtain <laughs> Star Wars cape. <laughs> I will still have the Star Wars curtain Yeah, you got you didn't bring it to LA with you no. either time. A lot of people were very disappointed. There's time, John. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's time. time. Yes. It may make an appearance or two on here. It's been, I just I just like reverting to the 10-year-old child me, and so you guys know exactly what you've gotten yourselves into. <laughs> I saw people in the chat room asking about a Magic the Gathering show on Collider uh, now. And oh, 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 there shoot. will be some Magic the Gathering. I felt like Rocky and Rocky Balboa, where it's like, I haven't done this stuff in 10 years, but I still got some stuff in the basement. <laughs> I saw I saw one of Macho Man Randy Savage. It's all, ooh, yeah. It's, it's a lot of good ones. It's a lot of yeah. good ones. All right, final question of the day. Sorry, all right, this last one comes from Coral. Uh, since, <laughs> since from uh, Walking Dead, uh, <laughs> since Deathstroke is more commonly a Nightwing villain, do you think we could get an indication that he exists in the DCEU? Well, I think it's important to remember that in both Marvel and DC, what they have traditionally done in the comic books doesn't really mean a lot to the filmmakers. I mean, you'll get the essence of who the character is, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to do this or this or things that happen in the comic book. Like, we talked about that a lot. Civil War is nothing like the graphic novel. Days of Future Past is nothing like the graphic novel, other than the key core, core story points. But look, we've talked about could Nightwing be a possibility in this universe? And I think the answer to that has to be yes. There has to be a possibility. I think it is a possibility. I don't think, though, that Deathstroke's introduction says anything for or against 
Nightwing at all. I, I don't think his presence there means, oh, well, then they must not be doing Nightwing because they would have introduced him with Nightwing. And I don't think it's, yes, that must mean there, there's going to be Nightwing because he's associated with Nightwing. I don't think either of those apply. I think it's just kind of neutral. What do you think, Christian? Same thing. I think it's neutral. I, I don't, I, and I, I'm starting to try to stop guessing on how they're going to do this. But yeah, yeah. I, I agree. I honestly agree with all your sentiments. What do you think, Mark? I kind of think it is an indication simply because if you're going to a villain like Deathstroke, that means you're paying more attention to the source material than previous Batman incarnations might have. So, so that might include somebody like Nightwing. I mean, we already know that there's the existence of Robin in this universe. So if Nightwing is also included in that, I think it would be a huge boom for the franchise. And I think it makes sense. Yeah, all the implications are there. You have a, a erect Robin suit that says jokes on you, ha, 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 by implication. <laughs> you said an erect Robin suit. No, a wrecked. <laughs> yeah. wrecked. A wrecked. It's a very hard yeah. Robin suit. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. It's hard it's to a, penetrate. That. It's a very firm one, too. Yeah. You know, like, you know, what when goes on in the cave around, stays in the, the cave. cave. It's cave The lock. suit tends to tense up when Batgirl shows up. It's weird how that works. <laughs> Show me on the suit where Bruce Wayne touched her. Uh, <laughs> so, so, but you have the Robin suit. Uh, uh, obviously, Jason Todd, by implication, is in it. So if Jason Todd's in it, Nightwing's in it. And uh, so I'm with you in the sense that because Deathstroke is coming in doesn't mean yes or no to the uh, Nightwing thing. I think he has to have a sit down with Nightwing. He's like, I was going to take out a demigod in Batman versus Superman. You weren't there. I thought we were pals. So we're going to see what happens. <laughs> All right, guys, that'll do it for us for this uh, very special installment of Clyde Movie Talk. Thanks so much for joining us. Listen, once again, the most important thing about the show is not what we have to say, it's what you have to say. Make sure you jump down to the comment section, leave your thoughts. Make sure you click the thumbs up button, share this video on your Twitter and Facebook accounts, and make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. I want to thank the guys sitting at the table with me. First of all, starting way over there on my right, Mr. Mark Ellis. Mark, where can people find you online? Ah, uh, you can find Jeremy Johns dropping me off at the Burbank Airport as I fly to <laughs> New York City tonight. I'll be there for Comic Con this week and I'm doing two very special headlining shows at New York Comedy Club Thursday. You can follow me on Twitter at Mark Ellis Live and check out our channel Schmoes No. Sitting right beside me, Mr. Christian Harloff. Christian, where can people find you? Twitter and Instagram at Christian Harloff. Obviously on Thursdays doing Collider Jedi Council and the big match today is Team Heroes versus the Wolves of Steel. Go check that out 2 p.m. PST. And uh, soon to be getting on an airplane to fly oh. back to Seattle, Mr. Jeremy Johns. Jeremy, where can people find you? Yeah, it sounds like Mark and I are going to be splitting an Uber. You can find me on <laughs> YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, at Jeremy Johns, Facebook, at Real Jeremy Johns. Very soon on the horizon, you can also find me here on Collider Movie Wee. Talk. Mm. Ashley and Wendy are over there. Ashley, where can people find you? Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, Ashley Mova. Happy Tuesday, guys. And Wendy? On Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat, at Wendy Lee Zaney. And, of course, you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all that good stuff, simply at John Campia. Make sure you subscribe to Comic-Con HQ to follow mine and John Schnepp's show, Film HQ. And a special thanks, guys, for joining us. Really excited about the announcement. Jeremy, thanks for being here this week. And oh, absolutely. We look forward to whenever we can get your moving arrangements all settled in and you can get out here. Oh, yeah, it's been a fun 10 days. It was supposed to be five, and then John was like, <laughs> Vegas. And he was like, eh, well, you know, why don't we announce something? So let's just do that, you know? So, hey, uh, it, it has been a lot of fun, and uh, I have faith it will continue to be fun. Uh, well, we hope so. All right, guys, that'll do it for us. Thanks a lot for joining us. My name is John Campia, and until next time, bye bye Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.